Okay, thank you all so much for uh, turning out on this um, rainy evening. Uh, we're, we uh, apologize for the weather, but um, we can barely uh, figure out what to do about property taxes. We, we certainly can't control the weather, right? So, um, so but thank you so much for, for coming out. Uh, I am Vicki Bean. I'm one of the co-chairs of the uh, Commission on Property Tax Reform. And um, I want to welcome you all, and then we'll uh, go uh, through all of us up here um, who want to hear from you. But let me just say a few words about the commission. The commission was is a joint commission between the mayor and the city council. Um, they appointed the commission um, earlier this summer uh, and charged the commission with coming up with recommendations to make New York City's property taxes fairer, uh, simpler, and more transparent and charged us with hearing from you all about the problems with the property tax system, uh, studying uh, those problems and studying uh, the data, what the data show about the system, and coming up with recommendations. So our charge is to uh, hear from you all, to go back and deliberate about what we hear, to make some preliminary recommendations early in the new year, in January or February, then to come back uh, to the Bronx and hear from you about those preliminary recommendations and then to issue uh, final recommendations uh, sometime at the beginning of the summer. So we are very interested in hearing from you about the problems that you see with the property tax system, any recommendations that you have about how it should be reformed. Um, and so let me um, stop there and have everyone introduce themselves. James, let me start on this side of the table tonight. James Parrott. I'm uh, Director of Economic and Fiscal Policies at the Center for New York City Affairs at the New School. Ray Majeski, I'm Deputy Director, Chief Economist at City Council Finance. Latanya McKinney, City Council Finance Director. Carol O'Farrell. Ken Knuckles, I'm a former uh, Deputy Borough President of the Bronx, and I'm a Vice Chair of the City Planning Commission. And uh, my name is Vicki Bean, and I'm a law professor at NYU Law School and a faculty director of the Furman Center for Real Estate and Urban Policy. I'm Alan Capelli. Uh, I am a Staten Islander, but the uh, Bronx has always been like a second home to me. I was an assistant to Fernando Ferrer for a number of years. It was one of my favorite jobs. I'm a uh, class one property owner. I also, my family has a uh, co-op and I served as a member of a, uh, on the board of directors uh, and ran the cooperative for uh, about 20 years. So I'm pretty familiar with the problems there, but uh, I'm very anxious to hear what you all have to say. And I'm very happy to be back in the Bronx. Good evening, everybody. I'm Elizabeth Velez. I'm president of the Velez Organization, and I'm a commissioner for the Property Tax Commission. Francesco Brindisi, Office of Management and Budget, representing the Budget Director. I'm uh, Jacques Gia, and I'm New York City Commissioner of Finance. So uh, we're going to turn to our first speaker, and we do this just in the order in which you signed up, um, and that is uh, Yahai Obaid. Obaid. Am I pronouncing that anywhere near correctly? Um, I apologize. Yeah, that's close enough, I think. Uh, <laughs> well, tell us how it's really. <laughs> so good evening. My name is uh, Yahe Obeid. I'm a uh, federal employee, and I work as an air traffic controller at uh, Kennedy Airport. I'm also a community board uh, 11 member and an auxiliary police officer here uh, within the 49th uh, precinct. So a lot of my coworkers, they live in Long Island or Westchester and they pay about $15,000 in, in uh, real estate taxes, but they don't pay city income taxes or local taxes. So doing the math, I pay 7,000 in real estate taxes and 8,000 in city income taxes or local taxes as we call it, right? So I'm back to 15,000 to what my coworkers pay. The problem is I don't get what they get. I don't get the clean air. I don't get the air, good air quality that they get in Long Island or Westchester. The schools, we don't have the same school system as them. Government services, and most importantly, safety. We don't, we don't have that. 
but I pay for those things that they pay for. So I pay fully into the system, but I get less than 50% for what I pay for. I've also um, have an issue with something that you might not address, but you might just be aware of the entire issue. The college system, I guess now it's free for anyone who makes less than 125000 for state and city colleges. Well, I don't make that before taxes. Uh, I mean, I, yeah, I don't make that before tax. After taxes, uh, I, I make less that than, than that amount. So my point is, as you know, it's not what you make, it's what you keep. But I get treated in a way where I'm being chased out of the city because it's not fair. I'm not getting what I pay for. So whether it's for my kid going to college that I have to pay a full price, and how it's advertised that anyone making less than 125000 gets free education, those people were getting financial aid and free education anyway. So you didn't do it, anything. Those, those politicians in Albany didn't do anything for anybody. But it hurts the people like me that pay a lot into the system but don't get anything. I don't understand that, and I don't even know if this is the right place for me to express my concern, or if you folks even care about my concern. But thank you for your time. Thank you. Can, I ask, can I ask you a couple of questions? Uh, thank you, uh, first of all, uh, for coming out tonight. It's, uh, a, uh, uh, you're brave to uh, come out in this bad weather. You say you paid $7,000 in property taxes? Uh, what type of home do you, uh, or uh, uh, dwelling that you're in? I, I, it's a multifamily home, but uh, I, I don't know anything. I'm, I'm a first-time home owner, so mm -hmm. I've only owned the property for two and a half years. So it's a, class one, one, it's a class one property? I have no idea about the classes. All I know is in two and a half years, it's gone up 25%. And, and what would you say the approximate value of your property is? Uh, Probably a little over half a million. Okay. Are you are you saying it's a two-family home? It's a three-family home. A three-family home. Okay. Yeah, that was built over 110 years ago. So. Okay. Thank you. So I'm sorry. Is it a in in a co-op form or condo form or or you own the whole thing? The three the three families. No, I, I own the the three-family home. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Okay. And, and it's like my family live in there. It's not like it's I got a big family. Got it. And it's gone up 25% in the two in, years since you bought it? Yeah, in, two, in the two and a half years since I bought it. Do you re recall how much your assessed values have gone up? No. Uh, I'll be honest with you. I, I know there's a city site that I can check all that information. Mm -hmm. But when I look at that stuff, it doesn't make sense to me. I guess that's why you're here, so you can help <coughs> us make sense make out sense of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I don't know. I, I'll be honest with you. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so, sir, when you acquired your house, the first year, what were your taxes? They were, I think, like 4200 And now they're 7000 It's close to 7000 correct. It, was it new construction? No, you said I'm sorry? It's 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 no, it's, it's 110 years old. It's about to fall apart. So, uh, it's, you know, it is what it is. Okay, we, um, we do care, um, and we appreciate hearing from you. We don't the college issue is out of our jurisdiction, but I get your point that you pay a great deal and you want to see services in return for that. Um, but so we really appreciate hearing from you. Thank you. And the reason why I mentioned the state, because if you add up all the taxes, it's over $20,000 altogether. I know the state takes from the city, city takes from the state. You know, the tax system is complicated. I don't know how it works, but I know I pay a lot and I don't get enough. Yeah. Thank you. And also, I just want to say thank you for serving as an auxiliary police officer and for serving on your community board. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. or Ms. Um, Sweat? Hi. I know that you're bound by New York State law that limits your ability to change the property assessments and that's probably the biggest obstacle that you have to encourage the state to overcome. It's unfair for, the, it's unfair for taxpayers in the Bronx to be paying higher assessed values 
than trendy neighborhoods in Manhattan and Brooklyn. If people can afford to pay very high prices because of very competitive, very in-demand neighborhoods, and they want to live in those neighborhoods, they should be assessed accordingly. You need to work with all the wonderful people up in Albany and get them to change the law so that the assessments can be fair. The working class people of the Bronx and Staten Island should not be subsidizing really trendy, ultra mega, like we're the financial capital of the world. And there are properties here that are more valuable than the Vatican. And your hands are tied in assessing them properly. And who subsidizes that? Working class people from the Bronx and Staten Island. So it's really nice for you to come and visit us and put on a dog and pony show and ask our opinion, but you gotta go to Albany and you gotta tell them to change it. Thank you, Ms. Fenton. We will be making recommendations both for what the city can do and obviously for what the state uh, controls. So thank you for that. Um, uh, Kathy Miglio. I'm a one family home owner and I just wanted to. Can you see? Oh. Yes, I have a one family home in this neighborhood. I share the ownership with my husband. And um, I've been living in the Bronx for about 15 years now, and every year my taxes go up. I was wondering how much more they're going to go up. <laughs> and why? Is it because of neighborhood upgrades or because we got new trees, we got new gas lines two years ago? Like, are the property taxes going up? <laughs> By how much percent? Mm -hmm. We're struggling as it is. Like, mm -hmm. Do you have a sense of how much they've gone up over the 15 years? Like $60 every year. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the approximate value of your, of your home? I think it's 500000 And what would you say you're paying in real estate taxes? About 6250 That too. I don't understand like the assessments either. That needs to be more explained. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Egidio Cimentilli. I have My apologies. Cimentelli. Egidio Cimentelli. Cimentelli. Thank you for coming to the Bronx. <clears throat> I want to. Um, I came here. I read something in the papers about a 1%. Bronx pays 1%, the rest of the city's paying less. I said, oh my, I better. Then I read, then I got an email that there was this hearing. I said, I'm coming over. So I, um, I was hoping to get more information on it, but uh, since you're set up to take information, I, I, I'll, I'll comment on some of the issues here. Uh, specifically, the assessments. Mm -hmm. And the assessments in reference to Sorry, I just want to get my glasses. Assessments number one. Basically, it says the assessments of recent selling prices and similar properties in your neighborhood, how to determine market value. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, it, it sounds interesting, but the problem is we have, when you look at the comps and you see the developer buying that one family house or two family house and making a six story house, uh, building. It, it drives the prices up. It drives all the comps up. When you have supportive housing coming into a community, it brings the prices of the assessment of the rest of the community higher. When you have individual developers that come in and buy cash, which a lot of people are buying cash, the Bronx, for some reason, I have a real estate in my community. Uh, he's bringing people from Flushing. Why Flushing? He tells me a three-family house in the Bronx, seven, eight hundred thousand, and Flushing it's worth one point two or one point three. So people are coming over, and they're spending money. They're spending a lot of cash money. A lot of these sales they bring up the comps. The comps keep going higher and higher in the assessment, obviously, which is part of it, of market value, brings up the uh, the rest of it. I think that's not fair. It's inappropriate. 
I think we need to find out a fair system and which leads to the appeal process. If I have a, which I don't, but if I had a commercial piece of property mm -hmm. and I want to appeal it, I pick up the phone. There's 20 companies downtown. No money down. They'll do it for free. They'll take it off whatever the assessment <laughs> on the appeal process, which is great if you have a commercial piece of property. But if you're a resident and you have a one family house or two family house, who do you go to? There is no one. I tried to do it for a neighbor of mine. It's, it's so complicated and you have to meet the timetable. The assessor's timetable in the beginning of the year after the notices come out. I mean, it's very detailed. I mean, I was gonna do it for free, obviously, but the point is there are no, there's no system in place. There are no not-for-profit organizations. There are no groups mm -hmm. out there that are putting time into it and saying, seniors, come to us, we'll appeal it for you. We don't have that. We have it for, obviously, uh, ACLU has it for acquiring grant money for, uh, for defendants and so on and so forth. But for the senior that wants to appeal it, there is no mechanism for it. And I know my time ran out. I just wanted to add up about the foreclosures. The Bronx has the highest foreclosures. It's unbelievable. And some of them, not all of them, obviously, but some of them are due to real estate taxes. New York City real estate taxes. I mean, they're selling those bonds. They're charging 24% to the person. And the next thing you know, they're being foreclosed. On a six or $8,000 real estate uh, bill, you're in, you're in the Bronx courthouse. There's 600 cases as we speak here. They're backlogged. And the majority, not the majority, I must say, but a good portion of them are from real estate. Mm -hmm. The comps is, needs to be a fairer, simpler way to do it. Uh, when the comps go up, the community hurts. So thank you for your time. And I'm sorry I didn't come prepared for any specific detail, but uh, I think this is an experience that I'm throwing at you. Thank you so much. So Ready can I ask you? Go of ahead. course. If, if you have some specific suggestions, send it to us. Well, I, I believe I touched on three major ones. Yeah, no, I'm yeah. saying in addition. You, know, you were saying that you were. In addition to that, but I think mm -hmm. the three major ones, I think that's a lot in itself to, to handle. Mm -hmm. But uh, I would like to see more funding on the appealing process. I know we have the SCREE program, we have the disability program where we could reduce our, our taxes on there, the senior exempt uh, program, and, and even that becomes a, a problem. We don't have the mechanisms to actually people to go in and, and actually do the application process. Mm -hmm. So it has a, an effect. So when, when I would like to see an appeal, I'd like to see some city money allocate uh, to some sort of uh, advocacy group, not-for-profit organization, to do appeal for homeowners. Mm -hmm. I think that would help with some of these seniors. You're a senior, you have no income coming in. You have a house, you might be sitting, you'll be surprised how many seniors are sitting on a half a million dollar house and can't pay it because the income is not there. Mm -hmm. right. And they're behind. So I, I, I hope this commission, honorable commission here, please, uh, we need some we need some advocacy. Talk to me a little bit more about the appeals process, because you, you've made some very interesting suggestion here. I mean, in theory, the tax commission, which is the first appeal, is supposed to be reasonably accessible to the homeowner. You know, someone in class one isn't supposed to need an attorney, and they're supposed to be relatively supportive of that. Obviously, you didn't find it that way. Well, what happens is you, you get your notice, and right mm -hmm. on the notice, you have X amount of time to appeal it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and who do you go to? I mean, you know, forms are very difficult. We have a very immigrant uh, community. Uh, not, not everyone is tech savvy. Also, everything is tech savvy. If you're, mm -hmm. if you're over 50, and I'm over 50, so I struggle with my phone. I'm still struggling with it. <laughs> so We're all struggling. The, the issue is that we need input. I, I, I believe there should be funding a lot of not-for-profit organizations. I'm surprised <laughs> they're not out there for residential. We do know the commercial appealing process is, mm -hmm. is very competitive, and, uh, and th that's fine. But for the residential, I can't see why the city can allocate some outreach money, some gr uh, grass money or seed money to, to put into these, uh, to set up an appeal process, to make it more convenient. I, I have people call me, they have, even with the senior exempt. I went to my local politician's office, they want this, they want that. 
I can't get it done, or they're telling me I missed the deadline. So it, it's not as simple. It might uh, look good on paper, but when you go to apply it, especially with different human aspects of it, it has, it has a different outcome at times. I understand I'm helping a friend who's, appeal, who's having an issue with the senior rent increase exemption, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a bit of a challenge. It is, it is, and uh, it, especially now the state requires a, a additional documentation, which makes it more, a little bit more difficult, a little bit more difficult. I, I had understood that Neighborhood Housing Services did some of that. Did you talk uh, about that? We or? have one located on Gun Hill Road, and then we have one located on Zuriga Avenue. I think the Zuriga Avenue, I've referred people there uh, for some, you know, obviously they have some programs, the city has programs, uh, HRA has programs, if your boiler breaks down, yeah, there's emergency money for border repairs. If your roof comes in, if you're a certain uh, age, yes, of course, those they're available there. Uh, the only one that's active, I think it's NDCI. Am I correct? NIDC or one of the group, one of the organizations. Please forgive me if I don't recall the name, specific name. But the, there's one located on Office of Riga Avenue, uh, the TW uh, Union Hall that does advocacy. And, and I've referred people where they, were, they had problems with their boilers, uh, 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 seniors that had problems with their boilers and they needed emergency repairs, which is fine. But the assessment, the real estate has, still has, it is a big chunk. Uh, uh, as I stated, people may be in, sitting in half a million dollar homes and, and can't afford the oil and they go behind and behind. And, and while we know it takes a while for the city to catch up on the realists, on the taxes before they start selling the bonds, and when they do sell the bonds, then they sit on it purposely. The bond companies, the two companies that the city sells the bonds to, they sit on it, and they charge 24% compounded. So by the time in two years, they cover their costs for the lawyer to foreclose on them, they actually wind up paying for the lawyer fees to foreclose on them. And that's, that's not right. I think it's inhumane. The, the, the concept used to be, and even, and I'm, I'm Italian, I came from Italy, and just recently, in the past decade, they've imposed real estate taxes in Italy. And there was such an argument about it. What was it? Because the concept was, if a person has a house and he cannot pay his lights or water or whatever the case may be, he still has a roof. There's no foreclosure. The government does not come in or the process of foreclosure come in there. They say people have homes for five, six hundred years. Here, you miss for three months. You know, what happens? You're in Bronx Courthouse, online with the rest. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we really appreciate hearing from you and we'll certainly look into the, the issue of the funding. So, well, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Gregory, uh, to Hello, uh, nice to see many of you here. Uh, Mrs. Bean, I believe you were in charge of HPD for a while, and I want to say that you made a decision that greatly benefited something that I was involved with, so I'll possibly talk to you afterwards if I have the honor. Glad to hear. Okay. Uh, I came here today because I started to read the rhetoric that is going on, basically saying that, look can at the rich you, people. I'm sorry, can you speak in your mic? Can you raise the uh, I, okay. microphone? Let me say who I am. I am a real estate broker. I've been doing real estate in the Bronx for over 15 years. My firm does about maybe $200 million worth of one, two, and three family homes mostly. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we rent apartments, we have 125 agents. Uh, average sale price between 350 and 400,000. So my expertise is really dealing with the homeowner. And I'm very proud of the fact that I've made many people become homeowners prior to this being uh, you know, a place that has appreciated 20% maybe in the last year or two. And so now I'm hearing the rhetoric, look at those rich people in Park Slope and in Manhattan, they pay a smaller percentage. Therefore, we need to eliminate the 6% cap and the 5% cap on real estate taxes over five years. And for me, it sounds like I'm putting my noose in the neck, noose around my own neck, by saying, look at those rich people, because you know what, the Bronx also appreciated 20% in two, in two years. So now, I don't think anybody should say, I can't budget a city and I need more than 6% a year in a tax increase to the hardworking people. 
to the people who, you know what, are responsible, the people who bought a house, the people that, uh, you know, pay their, pay their real estate taxes. Now we're saying, look at those people, they're paying a higher percentage, let's get rid of the cap. I think getting rid of the cap is horrific. I think what you need to do is you need to control your expenses. That's what really needs to happen here. All right, now, I believe there is an attack on the private land ownership rights of New York City people. And you're gonna start seeing m massive flight. All right, I mean, I, I, just, I just think that I, as a new home buyer now buying into the, buying into the uh, country club area, it's like, I don't wanna see my taxes go up more than 6% a year. Because, you know, my wife comes from Russia, I've been to their system over there, you know what I'm saying, where you, know, you had to wait online, you had to get a voucher, you had to pay the government official, right? You had to get at the top of the line, and then hopefully you would get into some apartment building and you have to beg and you know, wait years to happen. This is America. In America, I work, I get paid, and the government should really stay out of my life as much as possible. We're really coming to a point where we are, we, I, tell, I tell my friends from the Soviet bloc nations, from Bulgaria, from Yugoslavia, from, from Russia, and they see it. We need, to, we, need to, we need to step back from the private landowner because we're getting to a point where, you know what, let me not just say problems, but solutions, all right? I, what I'm here today to say is protect the one and two family homeowners. Don't get rid of the six, don't get rid of the six percent cap based on other people. Uh, and there's things that I really take offense to in this income discrimination laws that are going around. We are destroying uh, it, the property rights of Americans. I, I had one guy that went to Section 8, and he says, I'll rent to anyone you want to, but it's got to be with my lease. This is a man from Montenegro. And I said to him, this is very ingenious. Why should the government tell me what the rules are as to how I rent in my own property, especially with my experience that I have with them? I mean, I rented one tenant, DSS, and I, and I was naive. I gave the keys before they, before they paid me, right? And then I get a call from DSS and said, well, who did you represent in the transaction? I said, I was a dual agent because I represented the, the seller. I advertised the unit. Mm -hmm. They said to me, we, we can't pay you because you represented both the seller and the buyer. And then they go to me, uh, you know, th th they basically said, have you ever rented anything from this landowner before? I said, yes. And they said, well, you have a relationship with the owner, therefore we can't pay you. I'm like, so what am I running around spending my time? So you have control of the leases going into the rental properties. You have control of how much you're paying the agents, which is now infringing on my, on my de decision as to what I'm selling my labor for. And then you tell me that we're not leaning too far to the left. So I really think that this, uh, these, income, these income discrimination laws are, are crossing the line in many ways. I know you want to solve the, whole, the problem. But spending $4 billion on solutions to th throw more money at, there's an army of people out there who need housing. There's an army of them. And they're not, and, and they're coming with all just throwing money and throwing money and throwing money. But still, I've seen ten, a 10,000 increase in the last de a few years of people in our shelter system. Okay. We, that, um, I hear you on the source of income discrimination and the shelter issues. Of course, that's not property tax, but we very much appreciate hearing from you about the growth caps and, as you said, the difference in rates between what you pay and what some other neighborhoods pay. So are there any other solutions that you have on property tax? I think I've said enough. I mean, I okay. could go on forever, but you know what? Uh, in an economy, you want stability. And when you start erratic changes, yep. you might say you want to burn it to the ground and start all over again. but. My wife came here from Russia because she came from instability. Yes. America offers stability. Whatever you do, do it on a rational basis, nothing drastic. Okay, because thank you, you, very will, much. You, will, you will have the next wave of homeless people. And you know what? I don't want my mother being online looking for a voucher. I want her to be independent in her own home because that's what she deserves. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Marianne Rothman. Good evening again. Um, my name is Marianne Rothman. I'm executive director of the Council of New York Cooperatives and Condominiums, which provides information, education, and advocacy 
for housing cooperatives and condominiums throughout the city and beyond. Uh, the Council and it, the Council of New York Cooperatives and its Action Committee for Reasonable Real Estate Taxes have been working for decades for a property tax system that would deal fairly and equitably with all New York City taxpayers and that would be easy to understand. Um, and that really is the challenge that you face and this is the third hearing I've come to and uh, each shows that there are more challenges to overcome so I wish you lots and lots of good luck. Uh, there's certainly the brain power on your commission to do this. As far as my organization is concerned, our top priority is to have equal treatment for all forms of home ownership. All residential property should be assessed in a uniform way and subject to the same tax rate. Mitigating overlays, often called circuit breakers, should govern reductions in these taxes for homes that are occupied by their owners as their primary residences for owner, and for owners meeting other qualifications such as persons with disabilities, seniors, people meeting income qualifiers, people making um, acknowledged energy improvement changes or changes to the physical plant. And then these um, reductions would disappear at an expiration time or when the person left the home. Mm -hmm. uh, it's clear to me that we have to do away with the old system and look big picture and new ideas, but it's also clear to me that if there, where there are changes, they'll need to be phased in gently and gradually uh, so that there isn't horrible shock for taxpayers. <clears throat> in 1990, our Action Committee for Reasonable Real Estate Taxes suggested a two-class system, a residential class and a commercial class, integra integrally interlocked um, so that when taxes went up on the one, they went up on the other as well. At the time, the ratio with the, we proposed was a one to two ratio. I don't know if that would make sense at this point in time. Sadly, all my experts from 1990 are no longer with us. Um, but um, I thank you for your work. I thank you for your gracious listening to all of us in all these hearings, and I wish you lots of good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Marianne? Yes. May, may I just ask you, I mean, you, you, posed, you suggested a two-class system with what effectively are two different tax rates for the two classes on it. But you also said circuit breaker as a way of addressing homeowner issue, a homeowner based. Why do I need two different rates if I'm going to have a circuit breaker to address, you know, the needs of homeowners and homeowners who have low incomes? Um, you no, know, it's just taxing re residential te property lower than commercial property, you know, but not well, connected to the need of the specific homeowner. Why would I need that? Pardon me for asking a tough have to question, but you're I someone who can answer through. it. I'll have an answer with the Brooklyn here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think our initial theory uh, was that residential property isn't, uh, it's, it's for living and it's not, there's not a profit motive. Okay. However, there are so, there's so much nuance to the residential class. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, have, I have to think this through. That was a very good question. Okay, thank you. We, we look forward to hearing your answer in, in yes. Brooklyn. Yeah. <laughs> uh, ne next week, yes. <laughs> uh, Council Member Mark Jonai. Thank you, first of all, for being in uh, the Great Borough of the Bronx and uh, hearing the concerns of our homeowners and property owners. Certainly, when it comes to our residential homes, which in most cases is the single largest investment that many of us have, uh, many of my constituents um, feel that they, they're being priced out of the communities that they've come to grow up in and love. Real estate taxes that they're faced with, the increases, uh, has subjected them to making decisions whether they continue to live in the communities that they know 
versus having to look for areas that they could afford to live in. And certainly they do not feel that they're receiving the city services that warrant an increase. An attack on the middle class is a concern, making sure that New York City remains affordable for all, but when the largest tax bracket is the very group that we're trying to protect, and that is our renters, and that burden is disproportionately placed on multifamily buildings, which means city charges landlord, landlord charges tenant, tenant pays landlord, landlord pays city. The real culprit here is New York City. Um, a much fairer system has to be in place. I will wait to hear some of the uh, testimonies and hearings before I come up with a final uh, position on the tax brackets and the classes that we need. But certainly, this administration has taken the position where well, we haven't raised taxes. Well, you haven't raised the rate, you didn't have to. As the property values continue to increase, the tax base has increased. This year alone, it's a billion dollar rent, a billion dollar increase in real estate taxes. And for the next four years, our projection is billion dollars year over year. That money is going to be on the backs of our homeowners and our tenants. We need to be a, take a proactive approach to protect our citizens and make sure that we don't force them out of their homes. So thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Unless you have a question for me. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Uh, Zagreed? Good evening. I represent the Northeast Bronx Association as its president. I'm also a member of Community Board 11 and its sergeant at arms. In the area that I represent in the Northeast Bronx, the majority of the owners are 65 and over. If I, if I actually took a survey, it's probably 70 and over. These people live on fixed income. The values of these homes have gone up, or supposedly gone up, but these people are living on these homes. So if you value a home at $600,000, they're going to pay over $7,000 a year in property tax. What's not being said is that your water and sewer tax, which is not counted as a tax, but it's a service, adds up to $2,000 a year. I personally own a house on Thiemann Avenue in the same area. I pay over $9,200 a year for a two-family house. Mm -hmm. Now, the houses in my neighborhood don't sell for $800,000. Maybe they sell for six fifty, dollars and yet I'm assessed at $800,000. That's impossible to figure out. On top of that, I pay $2,100 in water and sewer for eight people living in the house. I assure you that I don't have water flowing left and right, but we're not taking into account the water and sewer. It is a tax, ladies and gentlemen, whether we like to believe it or not, because our counterparts in Westchester County are probably paying $800 a year at most. There's actually places that they pay $125 a quarter. So there you, there's $600. So you want people to live in the Bronx? Stop chasing them out of the Bronx. I am seriously thinking of moving to the Carolinas because I'll pay less than half and get triple the amount of value. Thank you. Thank you. Questions I'll be more than happy to answer. I'm, I'm confused. The association that you represent is a homeowners association, co op? No, what, uh, neighborhood association. Neighborhood association. Okay. Thank you very much. I've mentioned you, that your community yeah, is heavily seniors who own. There is a senior homeowner exemption designed to assist seniors in just the problem you said. Have people been able to make use of it to your knowledge? Again, depending on the age, a lot of these people don't have computers or don't know how to use computers. Mm -hmm. And to start the process, as you know, it's not the easiest process out there. And the city, I don't know whether they'll make it simple. They are welcome to attend my meetings. They are the last Monday of each month at Kings Harbor Nursing Home, and we welcome them to come there and provide the help. Thank you so much. And I, I should say that 
Um, the Department of Finance has folks outside of the auditorium in case there is anyone who wants to take up, apply for SCREE or DRE or, uh, you know, take up any other issues about their particular um, taxes. We have a staff here. She could be able to help you if you have any questions. Okay. So is, are, is there anyone who hasn't spoken who wants to speak? Yes, sir. Sorry, I didn't register to speak. My name is Howard Burkhardt. I live in Country Club. I'm a member of the Country Club Civic Association, and I'm also a member of the American Turners, which is a, uh, a society on the, uh, East Chester Bay where we have our clubhouse, and we've been there for many, many, many years. But in speaking of taxes, what's been happening is the taxes just keep on going up, going up, going up. And as far as it goes for our club, what happens here is you're just getting to the point as you pass it on, the membership starts shrinking. What's happening with the households, you keep going up, and you look around and you find out there's different rates in different areas, in Queens, in Brooklyn. I'm not sure what the rate is or how it should be. What I'd like to see is a fair representation of what we have to pay, and it should be equal for everybody, if it's a one-family house or a two-family house, whatever it is, we should all be paying the same rate. Your area shouldn't be different than my area. When you read things in the paper, you find that someone owns a house that has bigger value than me and pays less taxes. I started off paying like $1,600. I'm up to almost $5,000, $5,500 now, and it just keeps going up. If it isn't the rate, it's, it's, it's the value. At some point, we, we, we can't control the expenses, but it seems the city can keep passing on the expense to us in the form of taxes. How can you keep going up, 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 and up, and you're talking about a billion dollars this year, but you're going to push people out of the city. People want to stay here. People like it here. Whether you're a senior citizen, whether you're a young person who's just starting out, police, fire, sanitation, we want these people to live here. But you're getting to the point, you just keep passing on taxes. It's like the bridge tolls. You just keep passing things on, and nothing gets done. So what we need is a fair evaluation of just how to apply property taxes to everybody equally. And I know there's a lot of ramifications I have known nothing about, but I just think we need a fairer process and we just can't keep increasing these year after year after year to cover expenses that we as individuals can't do anything about. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Pedro Alvarez. Hi, my name is Pedro Alvarez from the Merchant Association. Oh, one of the reasons that we come in to speak to you is regarding to the, the landlords or the, the property owners that has to take the situation that we have with the homeless, uh, especially in the corridor in uh, Jerome Avenue. By Jerome Avenue and 176, when I have one of my properties, there is a bunch of homeless people that they get into the into the business, they want to use the bathroom and they don't care, they, that is a, a situation that we need to face. And the taxes has been increasing for the, for the past uh, uh, 10 years. Now we pay like uh, $32,000. Uh, the, the taxes has been folding in, uh, for the past 10 years. And now the situation they carry on with the adversity of the people in, of, of the homeless in the community, we as a business owner and uh, a property owner has to carry that situation. We not as empty landlords that basically they have a triple net lease and they don't care because they're not facing day to day the, the neighbors that we have. And we would like to be taken into the formula that you do or you have in order to increase the taxes because we need to share because we want it to be part of the neighborhood. We want it to be part of the uh, sharing the space and the business that we have in. Now, how come we being penalized in the way of taxes for the fact that we wanted to stay there? And we want it to be part of the neighborhood and the changes that it happened. The increase in taxes so high is making it difficult for us to stay there. We're going to, uh, the city or the, uh, or the way that the taxes are meant to be or, or the way that they're progressing is being, uh, basically bringing our city landlords 
that they don't care, have a triple net, and let's continue raising the prices and forget about the, the people in the neighborhood. And the, what is the, the base of New York City? Small businesses that has been in the, also sharing the space with the big companies, the, uh, the big change, the, the national change. So therefore, I would like you to take into consideration the landlords or the, the property owners that have to deal in the neighborhood with the homeless and people that are in the, in the downsides of the society and that we need to deal with them day to day. So when you raise the taxes, please take that information into consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Alvarez. Uh, Mr. Alvarez, may I ask you a question? Uh, you said your taxes were $32,000 per year. Is that what you said? Yes, that is what. So you have a commercial property on Jerome Avenue? A commercial Avenue? property, yes. Uh, what, what kind of property is it? It's a two-story commercial building, 1781 Jerome Avenue. 1781 at Birom Avenue. So is there a commercial uh, uh, business in it, operating in it? Or? Yes, yes. I have my practice, we have our associates that we do accounting and tax services, and also the, yes. Okay. An office building. It's an office building. Basically, we have an office on the first floor that we occupy, and the second floor is a hall for rent. How, how, big is your building approximately? Do you know the square uh, footage? 5,000 5, square foot, 5,551, 5, 5,000 square feet. Total? Total. Both, both yes. floors? Yes. Thank you. Like 25 on the first floor and 25 on the second. Unchanged. Not, uh, not exact amount. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. And how long have you owned it and, and how have your taxes gone up? I got it into, I got there with a lease with an auction to purchase in the year 2002. I closed on it with an SBA loan in the year 2004. And the taxes were like less than 10,000. And the lately on the last five years has been like folding. Uh, now the, uh, to a point, last year we paid $32,000. This year, we're trying to get to a reduce. We hire a lawyer to try to review why the taxes are so high. Mm -hmm. Because even uh, I had the, 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 the person on the second floor that is renting the space, and I was trying to, uh, to take the, the, to help him with the taxes. Mm -hmm. And she couldn't. She told me plan, uh, uh, point blank, no, I cannot continue. It's always been rented, or do you have trouble renting it? Uh, has been on and off. I that the, the tenant that I have has been there for the past five years. If I have to rent the increase the rent, she's uh, she's telling me that she's it's going out. Gotcha. We she has been month to month because we cannot increase the rent anymore. Uh, that is another situation. The rent is not increasing to a pace, or businesses are not increasing to the pace that the taxes are. So therefore, you need to take that into consideration. Because the, the tenant is telling me, if you increase the taxes, I'm out. I cannot take it. We have been for a year, month to month, because there is no way for us to uh, compensate the increase. So that is a, another element that you need to take into consideration. Thank you so much, Mr. Alvarez. You're welcome. We appreciate hearing from you. Is there anyone we haven't heard from who wants to speak? Sir. Hello, my name is Rafael. Uh, my parents are a owner of a one-family home. So I'm kind of new to this um, property value system. But it seems the basic, one of the basic problems everyone has is on why property taxes are going up is because everyone's market value is going up, which is not a bad thing because phantom appreciation. Um, does New York City have the ability to change um, it, on a, um, to change a property tax system from your property taxes being based on the market value into a system where it's based on the price you paid for your home? The price you paid for your home. Something that's stable, because that's a stable price. So the, the question, right, the question of what we can do without state approval is a difficult one, but um, that is part of the state law, so that would have to be changed at 
you know, state at the level. state level. Right. right. That's all. Thank you. Um, thank. So, I'm sorry, sir. I missed your last name. Uh, Schweizer. S C H W E I Z E R. And your parents own a two-family. One family. One, one family. Mm-hmm. And you've seen their taxes go up because um, of the I haven't. Um, no. So they just bought it two or three years ago. I haven't really I asked them. But the main issue here is everyone's taxes going up because their property values go up. Right. What, why should someone's taxes go up just because their property value goes up? We, we, all, we all know that if the housing market crashes, we're all screwed. So are we hoping that the housing market crashes so our taxes don't go up? So I think the, just that basis, this whole property tax system is very flawed. And that's my opinion just from an outsider, I don't own a home yet, but that's the one thing that must change. At my brother in Austin, Texas, same thing. Austin, Texas is a blast, you know, there's a boom out there. Everyone's moving to Austin, buying one million, two, two million um, dollar homes. And people are put, being pushed out of their neighborhoods because their property ta- value is going up. Right. It's like, it's silly. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Anyone who hasn't spoken who would like to speak? Um, okay, we uh, very much appreciate, as I said, you coming out. We um, said that the hearing would go on until 8, so we will be here in case anybody shows up um, in the next few minutes. Um, but we very much appreciate your, um, uh, your coming out on this rainy day, and we uh, look forward to being back with you with some recommendations. We will be around and so can speak to folks after you may say one thing. <laughs> yeah, one other thing that is that uh, you know I chose to educate my kids in a private school. Mm-hmm. All right, I, 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 I was a teacher in the public school system for three years. I didn't like what I see. I was a product of the public school system my entire life. Mm-hmm. I, think, I think things were done to it that make it deficient. And I think that we need to really start considering that if I'm paying for my son and, and daughter to go to private school, that there should be some consideration some type of a tax credit uh, you know and the other point is that you know what we have a beautiful school that was started a hundred years ago by my immigrant family because they wanted to be in control of their education so by providing the tax credit it also allows people the opportunity to be in control of the educational institutions in their neighborhoods so that's a point okay. that I have no Thank idea you. why there's no tax credit for people who pay yeah and are not t- partaking in the school system. Thank you very much. System. Thank you all, and um, uh, we really appreciate, again, your coming out on this rainy day and appreciate hearing from you. And we look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you very much. You may? Yeah, about 10 minutes. I just, I, I want to, um, in reference to the class one profit, specifically for the class one properties. I mean, the last time I looked at the, at the stats, at, which has been a while, the class one properties are the bulk of the revenue of the real estate. Am I, is that the same situation? It still is, okay, I didn't think it changed much. But the class one properties are the backbone. The class one properties are the working community, working class community of New York City. And I found it, when I, I remember looking at it, this must have been about two years ago, when I looked at it, I found it very strange that the class one properties were the backbone of the city and revenue, while the, the commercial aspects of it, the multi 20, 30 apartment buildings were the least amount. The Manhattan properties pay the least amount of, of revenues. So I thought there was somewhat of an, in a, in, not a fair playing field that the middle class, the working class, must continue to subsidize landlords, developers. I don't believe that's right. I think the developers need to pay their fair share. And I thank you. Thank Again. you very much. And we, we certainly will be looking into that class share system and the tax abatements and exemptions. Thank you very much. Any new folks who have arrived?